Uh, can you hear me all right in the back? Okay. Uh, so I'm Jim Fulton. I'm from Zoom Corporation. Uh, uh, and uh, I'm very happy to be in Argentina. Uh, I'm happy the, the weather's great today. Uh, it's, it's nice to see you all. Uh, I apologize for not speaking Spanish. I wish I did. Someday, maybe. Um, okay, so uh, what I want to talk about a little bit today is uh, a common mistake we make when, uh, when designing APIs uh, of trying to do too much. And, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's, there's a justifiable good desire to try to make things as easy and powerful as possible, uh, but a lot of times less is more. Uh, so I just wanted to get, you know, walk, through, walk through some examples of that. So we're going to look briefly at the uh, Zoe 2 publisher, the Zoe 3 publisher, uh, uh, Python, the config parser from the Python standard library, and we're, to, to be a little bit different, we're going to look at an example from uh, a JavaScript library. So, uh, uh, how many people here have used Zoe for Plum? Okay, wow, not that many. Um, well, Zoe had its, had its uh, beginnings in a project uh, called the Python Module Publisher, which was, uh, had sort of a friendly name of Lobo. Uh, oops. Ah, sorry about that. Just quickly, I have control a few applications. Yep, there you go. Um, <coughs> So, uh, in many ways, Zope, when it first came out, was kind of like, for that time, what Ruby on Rails was when it came out. It was something that allowed you to, to create applications very, very quickly. Going back before that was something called, again, the Python Module Publisher, and it was based on this idea that you should be able to take any Python module and somehow put it on the web, make its, make its information available on the web. And in many ways, it was, you can think of it as kind of a science project. Um, at the time when you wrote web applications with Python, you did so with the CGI module. Uh, and it was very tedious. I mean, you basically you know, uh, called very low level APIs. Uh, and you had to do a lot of work to do something fairly simple. So um, the Python module publisher um, basically tried to make that as easy as possible. And, and, and as an experiment, uh, it, was a, it was a really successful experiment. Basically, the idea was it treated the web as a collection of objects. Um, and you, uh, you, you can associate an object with the URL. So if you had a, an application on the web, uh, the, the, the URL path was mapped onto an object access. And as you traversed the URL, you would do things like uh, get attributes of objects, or get items in uh, dictionaries or mapping objects. Uh, and then once you found an object, um, Bobo would figure out how to call the object. It would introspect the, uh, the, uh, well, the, the, the object's arguments. Typically, the object was a method or a function. And it would figure out what, what names the object expected. And then it would, it would satisfy those names from request parameters, either using things like form variables, or CGI defined variables, or headers, or cookies, or whatnot. Uh, and that really worked well. And it, it was very successful. Uh, um, uh, and it allowed people to be very productive. But it had some downsides. Um, uh, <clears throat> They, it used, in order to do all of that, it had to have some, some basic rules. Uh, and the basic rules were conventions uh, that uh, if an object uh, didn't, have an under, didn't start with an underscore, uh, and if it had a dot string, then it was public and accessible and should be used. Uh, and if you knew about those conventions, well, first of all, if you're only doing an, an experiment in the lab, it didn't really matter. But if you knew those, if you were actually creating applications and you knew those conventions, it was still really pretty easy. And in those days, dot strings were still kind of new. And so, you know, it was unlikely that you'd sort of accidentally encounter something with a dot string that, that wasn't meant to be accessible. 
Um, over time, some additional hooks were provided. For example, an explicit protocol was provided to be able to control how that was done so that, so that you could uh, have, have additional rules. Uh, and, uh, and then a whole bunch of different, of different uh, additional hooks were, over, were added over time to deal with things like database and transaction management and, and, um, and error handling and other sorts of things. But, but ultimately, it, it, you know, and, and in fact, the legacy, the legacy of those decisions are with us today in, in, Zoke, in Zoke 2 and in, uh, in Club. And, uh, and uh, you know, occasionally there are, there are hiccups. So was that, you know, so, so, so did that really cause problems? Well, in the long term, it did. Uh, in the long term, uh, it probably was better to be more explicit than we were back then, uh, even though the initial e even though the initial result was very successful. Um, having having sort of rules that you have to know is is a burden, and the reason it's a burden is that people have to know what the, they, have to, they have to learn what those rules are, and they have to remember what the rules are. Um, and I think a lot of times, especially in systems that sort of follow the convention over configuration philosophy, I think they underestimate the, the load that those conventions have. Uh, people have to think about them, they have to remember them, uh, they, they have to pay attention to them when they should be pay, paying attention to their app. Okay, so uh, moving forward a little bit, uh, we have what I in earlier slide referred to as the Zoke 3 publisher. In the Zoke community, we're trying not to talk about Zoke 3 too much because the, the goals of the Zoke 3 project ended up not being to replace Zoke, so Zoke 2, so it, it ended up not making any sense to call it Zoke 3 anymore. Uh, but uh, old habits die hard. But the, the new name for it is the ZTK or the Zoke Toolkit. And it has a publisher that was based on the Zoke 2 publisher, and it tried to it tried to apply the lessons that we learned in the Zoe 2 publisher about making things more explicit, um, but it, it ran into some other issues, which I'll which I'll describe. So, uh, so very similar to Zoe 2, there's this notion of traversal, which is um, which is based on this op this idea that you start with an object and then you traverse it to get to other objects. Uh, if I have time at the end of the talk, I'll, uh, I'd like to come back to that since uh, Alan mentioned it in his talk. <coughs> um, and then, then we call objects. Uh, there's some other features that I didn't really describe that, that are kind of useful in a way, but maybe not such that it also provided. Um, I was reminded of those when uh, reviewing the code the other day and, and, and preparing for this presentation. Um, and in, in the case of the Zoe 2 publisher, we had a bunch of hooks that you had to provide in, in, in various sorts of not always convenient ways. And so I'm trying to, try to provide a more rational way of, of plugging the behavior. Uh, and in particular, it, it, made the public, it made publication much more explicit. So we were still publishing uh, objects and their methods, but we were being a lot more explicit about how we did so, which was a good thing. So the, the, the basic architecture is that you have the publisher itself, and in, in, in these days we use whiskey, so you, the, the publisher also has something that adapts it to the whiskey framework. Uh, and you have request response types. These are the kinds of things that you typically have with web frameworks. Um, uh, and, then, and then to provide application control, we had a, a plugin component called a publication object. And the publication object uh, basically embodied all of the hooks that we had, we had accumulated over the years in the earlier version of the publisher. And uh, I won't go into detail. It's not really, the, the details aren't really important. Uh, this is an API that a, that a publication object has to implement. These publication objects really are are probably not the sort of things that you would write, write if you're writing an application. 
they were the sort of things that a, a, a higher level framework might provide. So for example, uh, we have a, one of these that's geared towards uh, storing your data in the Zoobaju database. But you can have a different one for storing in a relational database, or, or perhaps a different one where you don't store anything in any database. Uh, uh, perhaps, in, in some ways, the most interesting or the most controversial being get application. And remember, with traversal, you sort of start at a root object, and so this method got you the original object, the original uh, the original object to start traversing from. Uh, the API is not very interesting, really. Uh, you can sort of argue with it. You know, you could argue that we made lots of mistakes with it. You could argue all day about that. It's not really the point of the talk. And so, but the, the API itself isn't that interesting. Now, the way this should have worked, you know, the, the sort of essential complexity of this problem is that, uh, is that um, you, you should define your application uh, and you should be able to just plug it together uh, with with the publisher in a fairly fair, straightforward way using in, in modern days you know whiskey assembly tools like for example case deployment uh, but it didn't, didn't turn out to be that way now uh, how many people have seen it how many people do uh, web here okay and uh, how many people have used pace deploy oh not that many um, okay, uh, uh, okay, I'm going to address that. So anyway, paste deployment, paste deployment is this little tool for uh, gluing whiskey. Uh, how many people know what whiskey is? Oh, okay, a fair number, okay. Uh, it looks like pretty much all the web people know what whiskey is. So, um, so this is a typical kind of configuration for a whiskey-based app that uses paste deploy. You, you have some you know, some configuration for what, for your application, you have maybe some middleware, and then you have some configuration for your server. And it's pretty straightforward. Um, and, you know, defining your application, uh, well, as I mentioned before, you'll, you'll, you'll typically use, if you were to use this framework, you would use some sort of standard publication object that you would instantiate for your application. And it's traversal based, and, Traversal is actually kind of controversial. It's kind of fun to talk about. If we have time, we'll talk about it more later. So we, we, we made a couple of couple of mistakes uh, that really made the, the publisher not very successful, even within the Zoe community. So the original publisher, the original publisher, otherwise known as Bobo, was was actually wildly successful. Uh, the Zoop 3 publisher was sort of imprisoned in a lot of infrastructure that resulted from some, some, some mistakes that in part involved doing too much. Uh, the first mistake we made was that you want, you want to configure everything. Uh, and that, in retrospect, was a really silly mistake to make. Um, at the time that we did it, within the Zoop community, people were, were crying out to be able to configure and change a lot more. Um, uh, and then we also had this notion in Zope of uh, supporting many different kinds of requests. So we could support you know, your standard HTTP request, we could support XML RPC, we could support SOAP. Uh, we, even, we even got a little nutty and uh, used this framework to support things like FTP. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and not only did we do that, but we tried to free the application developer from having to deal with the details of doing that. So we wanted to do that for the application developer. So uh, as I mentioned, we had this, you know, in, in the Zoe 3 publisher, we would do this dispatching very, very early in the process. So when a request came in, it came in really before it even touched any application code, We'd introspect the request, figure out what kind of request it was, and then we would dispatch the different kinds of application components uh, based on the request type. Uh, and you know, the main advantage of this is it's kind of cool. Uh, the, the sort of lesser advantage of this is that you can have a single resource 
uh, that exposed itself under multiple protocols. And I suppose in a sort of a restful way that I could see where, where that would be attractive, although we did this long before uh, rest was fashionable and possibly in their business. Um, but that ended up making things really complicated, uh, especially from a setup point of view. Uh, there's actually a simpler way we could have done this, uh, which we've actually done in some of our applications at Zocorp, where we wanted to have some special processing for AJAX requests, and that is to simply uh, wrap your resources in some sort of uh, decorator or function that knows how to do that. So for example, in a, in a tiny little framework that we use at Zocorp to deal with uh, AJAX methods, uh, we have a wrapper, and that wrapper deals with um, uh, things like, you know, AJAX-specific error handling and response marshalling, and uh, someday we're going we're gonna to probably switch to, you know, the standard, the sort of standard uh, procedure in, in, in AJAX calls that most frameworks seem to use is to pass data to the call as form data and to get it back as JSON. Uh, I prefer to send JSON, but we haven't actually done that yet. But a little wrapper like that can sort of automate the details of handling that. So, you know, our Python functions are really nice, especially for AJAX, uh, where you don't have to deal with pointy brackets. Um, you know, AJAX, I really like AJAX because you're just moving data around. It's just like traditional uh, method calls. And in fact, when you reason about an AJAX method with a framework like this, it's just like reasoning about a regular Python program. You know, you don't have templates, templates, hate templates. Uh, so wrappers so are a really nice solution for dealing with different request types because you know, you, you can pick your application, you can pick your wrapper technology, your sort of means of dealing with the request details. You can pick that independent of your, of your web publishing technology. Uh, if you want to do it in a particular way, or maybe you want to innovate, you know, it's not all tied up with the publisher. In fact, um, uh, you know, over the years I've come to really like things that are highly decoupled. You know, I'd I, I like, I like my different web technologies to be independent of each other. I'd like to use something for publishing, maybe something else if I have to generate pointy brackets, or maybe something else if I you know, want to deal with the database. I don't really want all of those to be tied together in one, in one kit. I'd like, to, I'd like to be able to pick them independently. And it's actually really easy to do. Uh, the, only, the only real downside of this approach is it doesn't really make it convenient to have the same resource of it, you know, support multiple protocols at the same URL, but that's that's really not a problem that I have. So um, I just talked about that. So how did how did we how did we fail, you know, in, in, in terms of the publisher, and just to a lesser degree, well, to much the same degree in terms of the Zoe three project? Um, we focused too hard on replacing Zoe two. So when we designed the publisher. We were focused on, replace, uh, on reproducing what we had before, rather than really thinking about what, what the best solution would be uh, you know, for that particular time and place. Uh, we overused the component architecture. Uh, so we, we, we made everything, we made it so you had to plug everything, rather than making it so it was possible to plug everything. Uh, People really wanted everything to be pluggable, but they wanted things to be easier a lot more than they wanted everything to be pluggable. Um, so anyway, I've, I've talked about request types. I don't think I need to relate to that anymore. Um, the computer architecture is a really powerful plugin system. Uh, uh, you know, if you need plugins, you know, if, if you find yourself thinking about writing a registry or, or some sort of mechanism for plugging things into your application, I encourage you to take a look at the Zoom component architecture. Um, I think it's a nice general solution. Um, of course, you should only use a plugin system if you actually have a good reason to use to have plugins. Because plugins have a have a have a burden. You know, people have to you know, they, they introduce indirection, they introduce 
sort of emergent behavior. They, they can introduce surprises that, that you know, is sort of a downside. In fact, I would argue that, that all abstraction is bad. All abstraction is bad. It, all, it always it, 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 it introduces indirections, it introduces complexity, uh, it inter introduces non-locality. It's always bad in my opinion. But it also has lots of good things, and in many cases the good things outweigh the bad. But you should always realize when considering using an abstraction that, the, that you're carrying some bad along, and you better make sure that the good significantly outweighs the bad. Uh, so it, it would have been a lot better if the publisher could have been customized optionally without forcing people to deal with, with plugging or uh, components. So the, the, main con the main lesson here is that when considering features in, a, in an API, um, make sure you understand what the relative benefits and costs are. Uh, we have a saying around Zoho Corporation. Well, actually, I'm not sure it's the same, but we have kind of an, ex uh, an expression non, non grata around the Zoho Corporation, which is I can imagine. You'll, have, you'll be in a discussion with engineers and you're considering a feature, and somebody will say, Yeah, but I can imagine. And usually, you know, I've, I've, that's a bad thing. When somebody says, I can imagine, you should shut them up right about that, because that's usually a bad thing. Uh, so, uh, and, and, you know, pluggability should have been optional. Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll switch gears now to, to uh, look at something that's in the standard library. Uh, so config parser is a library that I get the sense a lot of people sort of love to hate and yet love because it's, it's a really simple format and a really simple model and simple has a lot of appeal to it. Um, but it's kind of a funny implementation, and people love to re-implement it in various ways. Um, I actually really like it a lot. I think it's, I think it's pretty ver versatile. It's actually kind of trendy because it's schemaless. I've noticed that schemaless is, is kind of a trend these days, and, and uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of an interesting one. But, uh, but it, you know, schemaless feels a little bit to me like the dynamic typing that we have in languages like Python and JavaScript and Perl and so on, and that it frees you from dealing with a lot of, well, when something has a schema, you have to tell it about the schema, and you end up spending time on the schema rather than your application. So schemaless things are, are kind of appealing in that regard because you don't have to do that. There's still a schema. Your application started out as a uh, configuration language for Grail. Does anybody, how many people know what Grail is? Yeah, yeah Grail was a, uh, was a web browser uh, developed by uh, the group that later became Python Labs, uh, Guido and Ed L at, at CNRI. Uh, and it was, it, was, uh, it was used as a configuration language in that, and it started out as being an RFC 822 which uh, RSC 822 basically means, you know, how many people have seen like mail and, and HTTP headers? Okay, well if you ever look at one, that's what the configuration syntax started out being. Um, and then it kind of grew with other projects uh, at CNRI and eventually was incorporated into the standard library. And so it has a kind of a, a crusty history where it started, it started out being something quite different and sort of evolved to the place it is now. Uh, by the way, it's actually gotten a lot better in Python 3.2. Uh, uh, so it's, 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 it's much saner now than it was uh, in the previous version. I think maybe partly because of the blog post I wrote last year. Maybe not. Um, anyway, so how does config parser get in the way? Well, it, for one thing, it really doesn't polish some things that it might polish, like like really defining its syntax well. Um, uh, until recently, not really providing a sane API. So you know, really what you want, what you want is you want to parse some configuration text. Ideally, you should be able to parse text. I don't, I don't know if the current config parser lets you parse a string. And then get back something that behaves like a, like a mapping of mappings. 
So you should be able to use, you know, get items, square braces with them, and get, and get values out of it really easily. Um, it also does some things that, that actually make it hard to use, like, like it strips values, and sometimes you don't want the values to be stripped. In fact, as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, in build-out, uh, which uses it, you really want to retain the relative indentation of value of multi-line values. So in build-out, we'll often use, uh, <coughs> Well, I have a, how, many, how many people have uh, hit build out? Use build out? Or know where it is? No, not too many. Well, you ought to find out. It, it's work, but it's worth it. Yeah. Sorry, the documentation is kind of bad. I tried. Um, but, uh, <clears throat> but in build out, we'll often have, within an option value, we'll have snippets of configuration from other configuration files that build out will end up generating. And sometimes the indentation is significant and, and it's lost because config parser strips values. Um, there's actually, I just learned in researching uh, for this talk that uh, there is actually an inline comment syntax in config parser. I don't know when it entered config parser. Maybe it was always there. Uh, but it was undocumented until uh, I think uh, I think until like Python 2.7 maybe. Uh, or maybe Python 2.6. Um, and I imagine some build-outs have been broken by that. I, I'm not really sure. Uh, and it's actually been removed in 3.2. Uh, the defaults and variable substitution are actually optional, but they sort of invite usage, and, and their usage causes pain. So, for example, if you use paste deploy, which is a tool that I like to use, um, if, if you have any, if you have uh, percent signs in your configuration, you end up having to uh, escape them because it uses this variable substitution syntax. It doesn't really come into into use all that often. I mean, it, it supports it, but I really don't think it's used that often. Um, and then there are lots of optional features that are on by default that you have to bother to turn off. Um, so, you know. It's doing a very simple thing, and it's very handle, handy to have something that does that simple thing. Uh, but you actually have to work a lot harder than you should uh, in order to use it. And for some things, it's just for some things that you just can't work around without not using it, uh, which which the newest version of Buildout actually doesn't use it anymore. Um, so an interesting a lesson here. Uh, it, well, amongst the lessons is don't don't be a captive of history. So, you know, it would have been a good thing if when they decided to add config parser to the standard library, they had stepped back and thought, okay, well, this is kind of cool. We used it at some projects at CNRI. What should this really do? What 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 sort of model should this provide? Uh, this is a little bit similar to the mistake we made with the Zo3 publisher and. and you know, maybe we shouldn't have tried to reproduce all the features of Zone 2. Um, and then if you're going to try to help somebody, you know, have, have sensible, you know, you can have sensible defaults, but, but make it easy to change them. Uh, a lot easier than, than Config Parser does. So Config Parser, I still use it, I like it, but, um, and the, the version of Python 3.2 is a lot better. But uh, it could have been a lot simpler and actually more useful if it was simpler. Um, okay, so um, we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about a JavaScript library. Uh, this is actually going to be the, 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 one of the best examples of what, what I'm trying to talk about this talk. But Dojo is a, is a high level JavaScript library. I like it a lot. Uh, it's far from perfect. Uh, but, but it's really nice that, you know, the thing I like about uh, the modern web is that we don't have to implement applications with HTML anymore, or at least not directly with HTML. And so with, with uh, libraries like Dojo and UE and EXT, you get to write at a, much, at a level at which you might be accustomed to if you use like desktop GUI libraries like Motif or I realize that's, that's dating me pretty badly, but WX Windows, I don't know, really, I guess QT, I don't know what the current ones are. Um, but um, 
But anyway, it's a very nice high level library. Uh, it allows you to write applications much like you would write a traditional GUI application. It also provides lots of useful facilities for doing low level web programming as well. Uh, you know, things like dealing with styles and animation and lots of other things. Uh, I just want to talk a little bit about their animation API because it's, it's a little hard to use and it could be a lot easier to use if they just emphasized and documented a, a core part of it. So, the animation API, the Dojo animation APIs, there are actually a bunch of APIs, but they all are based on a base API. And the base API was actually abstracted from a bunch of sort of evolved APIs. But the, the base API is very simple. So with animation, what you want to do is you want to create a visual effect, typically to help users perceive a transition in the application. So for example, in a, in a mobile app, when you go from from one screen to another, there's typically some transition, so it's, it's very visible that you're going from, from one part of the application to another. Or, uh, you know, there are lots of, lots of reasons why this might be used, but they're very commonly used to represent some sort of transition. And typically what you do is you might change a color or change a position or make something appear or disappear over some short period of time, like maybe a third of a second. And so the Dojo animation, uh, Hopefully, uh, just out of curious, how many people here do JavaScript? Oh, fair number, okay. Well, JavaScript is fairly easy to read, at least if you don't, yeah, I don't know what I mean. So here, basically, what you do is you create an, a, an animation object, and you tell it to play. And you give it this option called curve, which is kind of an oddly named option, but it really is just two endpoints. And the reason it's called a curve is that what Dojo actually does is it constructs a, uh, internally it constructs a curve in, in sort of the values and time, and it has various options for controlling the shape of that curve. But basically, you know, you want to start at one point and end up at another point, and you want to spend some time getting there, and most of the time you don't really care about the details. And if you do care about the details, there's some options to, to deal with that. And then you, what will happen is that you, you supply a function and that function will be called with values from this range as they're computed over that period of time. And there are things like frame rate and things that, that controls how often your function gets called. And then your function's job is to simply translate these values into something, anything you want. In this case, we're, uh, we're rotating an element. I apologize for the, for the source slipping off the slide. I didn't catch that when I was reviewing these. But basically, it's... Uh, it's setting a CSS style. It, it happens to be a CSS style that is currently rep, uh, implemented in sort of, not browser specific, but browser specific in the sense that you have to use a different style name uh, on each browser. Uh, so, so a more practical implementation would be slightly more com complicated than this to deal with the difference between browsers. But basically, you're, you're, you're computing a style property that says rotate the element. And this, if you were to run this on a WebKit browser, the, the whatever node you pointed it at would rotate in a circle over a period of about a third of a second. So it's actually pretty straightforward, and it's very easy to reason about. Um, so you can look at this, and you can see very easily what it's doing. Now, Dojo doesn't document this API, except it mentions it. It mentions it a lot, but it never actually tells you what the API is or how to do it in the documentation. What they document instead are some higher level APIs. Uh, for example, if you if you look at the Dojo animate, if you if you were to Google for Dojo animation or Dojo FX, you would first learn about fade in and, and fade out, wipe in and wipe out. So as you can imagine, fade in uh, or fade out, let's say, makes an element sort of slowly disappear by becoming transparent, eventually uh, disappearing, and fade in does the opposite. Uh, wipe in and wipe out basically causes it to sort of disappear from one side to the other, so it's like somebody wiped a rag over it. And these are kind of nice effects, but when you're designing a web app, you know, okay, but well what else can you do? You know? Like, for example, the wipe in and wipe out, you don't really get any control over what direction. You know, like, I wanted to do it, I needed, I needed to use this in an app, but I needed to, I forget, I think I needed to 
had to go from top to bottom rather than right to left or something, but uh, there was no easy way to get from that to what I actually needed. They've got this slide to, which is really kind of bizarre in terms of how hard it is, um, because it basically says, take, this, take some element and move it from where it is now to some other position. And the way that they specify the position is kind of, uh, kind of strange. Um, and then they have a more general API for animating properties. And this is, this is a little bit closer in that you've got some property and you, you, you've got some node and you can specify one or more properties and just tell it to an animate those properties from where they are now to, to some where, they, where you want them to be or you can provide starting and ending locations. So here we say make the width 300 pixels uh, and that's wrong, it should be units, isn't it? Maybe it assumes units, I don't remember. Um, <clears throat> from whatever it is now, and here we, we basically say, okay, well change the height from 100 to 400, and, and change the font size to 14 point from wherever it is now. And this is sort of straightforward, except that sometimes you want to do something even a little bit different than that, and that doesn't work with the uh, rotation example that I gave. Uh, because the rotation CSS property or the transform CSS property is more complicated than just an individual numeric value. Um, so if we compare the Dojo animation API, and I, I, I suppose I should have picked an example that was exactly the same, but, uh, but I was too lazy. But uh, you know, here we've got an animation, and we've got the animate property. Animate property is a little bit simpler. It's not that much simpler, uh, especially when what you want to do doesn't actually work with animate property. And now you're like, okay, now what do I do? Well, you start reading the source, and that's kind of complicated. And boy, you know, it's it's just really it's just kind of hard to figure out how to do it. But even if even if you uh, even if, you, uh, even if you know what the, all those APIs do and they do exactly what you want, if you use the high-level APIs, depending on how you count them, you have to remember four, or, or if, you, if you want to count the ins and outs uh, separately, you have seven APIs to remember, whereas the animation API is really just one API to remember, and, and it's just easy to remember. Uh, slide two, it's, it's you know, it's not as obvious what it does. Uh, <clears throat> and the, and the higher the API, higher level APIs are you know, less powerful, like they, they couldn't handle the transform case. Turns out they sort of could if you knew to load a, a, a special extension from the Dojo X module that, uh, or from a particular Dojo X module that, uh, that knew how to deal with that property, but if somebody came up with another property next week that that package didn't know about, well then you'd be out of luck. Because it really, you know, ultimately it doesn't fit the model with such a numeric value. Um, so, uh, so anyway, a, a simple versatile API that maybe required a little bit more typing, uh, I would argue would have been better than a collection of high-level APIs. Uh, what's somewhat ironic here is that the low-level API exists, but the, the, uh, it's unloved by its authors. The, the Dojo folks really sort of feel like it's, well, it's too low-level, people should use the higher-level APIs. But I really think they're missing the boat there, uh, because they don't, they don't appreciate the load that those extra APIs carry in terms of extra things that the developer has to know. Um, and, and also a very simplified interface like, like the fading interfaces or like the wipe in, you know, wipe in and net wipe out makes something that's fairly simple kind of complex and mysterious and inflexible. Uh, so why do people make these mistakes? Well, um, uh, history is a big factor. You know, we, we, we start with a sort of a point solution for a particular application and we generalize it. And when we generalize it, we kind of sometimes forget to generalize, you know, generalize the goal. 
the, the goal is to solve some general problem, because that's why we generalized it. It's no longer to solve my applications problem. Uh, also, you know, admirably, there's a desire to make things easier. But the mistake is often to make things easier by, by hiding details, or to make things easier by doing too much. So in the, in the Dojo case, we made things easy, they made things easier by hiding a bunch of details. But then if, if the abstractions that they provided didn't work, it was very hard to, to find abstractions that would. Um, I think to some degree in, in the Zoe Publisher cases or in the config, or in the config parser, there was a tendency to mistake if they actually do too much. Uh, and I think a lot of this comes back to, uh, to goals. Um, a common problem we have when talking about software is we talk about solutions but we often forget to talk about what problems they solve. Uh, and quite often when people argue about solutions, they're arguing about solutions to different problems. But in any case, when, when, when designing a library, it, it really helps to be clear about what your goals are. And I think if you, if you had been, if, if these had been a little bit clearer, uh, things would have gone a little bit better. Uh, and I'd like to, uh, to emphasize, uh, in particular, in the light of something that, uh, I, I wanted to agree with something Alan said earlier, that I think documentation is really important. And more importantly, I think goal-driven documentation is really critical. So when designing a, a, an API, <clears throat> you should identify what problem you're trying to solve. So your API has some user, the person who's calling the API, and they have some goal, which, you know, some, some problem that they're trying to solve. Uh, I find it very instructive to, uh, to actually write a how-to describing to, that, to your audience how they're going to use the software to achieve their goal. Uh, I find that when you do that, you see problems that you don't see otherwise. It's kind of like Alan's example of having somebody read the document back to you. Um, a little bit different. Um, but but I, uh, anyway, so nothing of that. Um, so anyway, that's, that's all I have to say. Uh, any questions? Can you go back a couple of slides, Jim? Sure. Just to the one where. I don't know. Yeah, we're about one forward again. Yeah, so when you say goal driven rather than solution driven. So, what. Uh, is, I recently gave a talk to the Django users and I criticized their documentation because it doesn't consider the audience's purpose. Right, is that the problem? Yes. So, when, when, when it. We, we have a problem, and, and the problem that we have in, in Zoe Corporation that, that I'm, I'm trying to correct, and it took me a while to recognize it, is that when engineers talk about software, they tend to focus on, well, say, to talk about software requirements or, or software user interfaces. They talk about the software because that's what they love, right? That's, that's what we create. We create software. Our software is beautiful, just like our children. Um, and, and so when we approach the user interface, really, the user interface is all about letting somebody get to our beautiful software. Uh, but really, the purpose of software is to solve problems. So the user has some problem they want to solve. And what we should be thinking about is how they use our software to solve their problem. And when we, when we think about it from the software's point of view, we sort of think about ways of making it convenient for the software and convenient for our elegant architecture. But really, we should be thinking in terms of how, how the user is going to solve the problem with the software. Uh, and you know, we, we've been trying to do this at Zocorp, uh, and we've used techniques like uh, making, you know, making somebody, whenever we're designing a new feature, we write, write a how-to for the feature, where the how-to is all about, if it's well written, how does the user achieve what they want to achieve? So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different point of view. It's looking at it from the user point of view rather than the software's point of view. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you.